Labor Talks was John DeRosier, recorded at Chippewa Valley Community Television in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Hello, this is Labor Talks. Our returning guest is State Senator Kathleen Vinehout, who was obviously re-elected to the Wisconsin State Senate. I believe she represents the 31st Senate District. My name is still John DeRosier. Kathleen, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hope you're feeling better. I'm going to be feeling just fine. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, thank you. Okay. What is going on in Madison? Well, there's an awful lot of people around the state that are asking what's going on in Madison. We've had three very, very difficult weeks. There, there was a, a big anti-labor bill that brought thousands and thousands of people to the Capitol and brought nationwide attention to what's happening in, in Wisconsin and particularly in Madison. And I want to talk about that bill today. And I also want to talk about what's happening in the state budget because I'm afraid that this horrible labor, anti-labor bill took away a lot of attention from what we should be focusing on, which is what's happening with the state budget. So first, I, I want to explain what's, what, what's known as Senate Bill 44. This, I brought the bill file with me, and this is uh, quite a very large bill. I've had hundreds and hundreds of constituents bring uh, to my attention their concerns. Uh, over 80% of the constituents in western Wisconsin are opposed to this bill. Many people travel to the Capitol to make their opinion about this bill be known. It is misnamed as the right to work law. I think you would, should probably call it the right to freeload. And on the surface, what it does is to say in a union shop, if you don't want to pay dues, you don't have to. Of course, no one's forcing you to work in a union shop. But what's behind it is to change decades of labor history and labor policy that have brought us peace between labor and management and have brought us a very productive economy here in Wisconsin. And I wanted to share a, a little bit of what folks have said about this bill, people that wrote from different parts of my district, and I brought sort of equally information from the people who are the workers and the people who are the managers or the owners of the companies. And I wanted to start with testimony from a construction company that is down in Black River Falls. I represent them in the legislature. Um, their owner's name is Mr. Jim Hoffman. Sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't agree. And in this particular case, he and I definitely agreed. And if you haven't gotten the hint yet, I'm opposed to this bill and tried very hard to stop it. Imagine that. <laughs> He's, I'm just going to read you a couple snippets because I think you'll get the story. He said, our company is our people. That's our motto. And we work in heavy construction equipment. He said, the legislation that's proposed will over time interfere with my company's abiling, ability to have a willing and able pool of trained workers. It will drain the union's ability to supply tr skilled and highly skilled trained workers for me by shortening by shorting them dues needed to to administer the contract and particularly he's talking about the training that that is done by the operating engineers and just to give you a feel for how well he's doing he says our company grew over 50 percent last year we used the operating engineers hiring hall to hire over 200 workers to grow our company we invested in new equipment and we were able to competitively bid because the operators that the union had skilled and trained workers available to staff our equipment and he makes an important point that this is their money not my money he said those good paying construction jobs are going to get replaced with minimum wage jobs and this is a theme that we heard over and over again that this is going to drive down wages not just for the union workers but for all workers this legislation and an, another piece of legislation we're hearing is coming through the repeal of what's called the prevailing wage statutes will mean a steady decline of skilled and trained workers who own, earn a living wage and along with it our family owned small construction company. Now he's very modest but their construction company is doing quite well and it's really quite large. He said what about 
my company. Why are you doing this to my company? We grew 50% last year and we hired 200 new workers. And then a fellow over in Minnesota got wind that he was unhappy. This is a Republican who, assemblyman who runs the, I think it's called the Assembly Committee on Jobs and the Economy. And he inv invited the Wisconsin company to move to, in his protest to this new quote right to work law to, he's planning now to expand in the Gopher State. Mr. Hoffman said he took up this assemblyman in Minnesota's offer and he's now going to move part of his business and expand the office that they already have. It's the Lakeville office. He said we're going to expand by at least two salary positions, those would be the support positions, and add another 15 to 20 hourly positions to the, in addition to the current 10, 10 to 12 that we have. And this, this got quite a, bit attention, quite a bit of attention around the country um, because Minnesota State Representative Pat, Pat Galifano um, called, this is a Republican from Farmington in Minnesota, called the Wisconsin right to work measure heavy handed and wrong and said it would hurt business owners who want to work with unions. Now, I'm going to state the obvious here. Well, I, I, I listened to the uh, hearings. Did you? Yeah. They're very long. In the, in the, in the, in the, both in the state, Senate, and the Assembly. Now listen to one Republican after another talk about how the companies paid for employers' training. And Not exactly true. No. Just, cause like you just pointed out, and like a, a previous uh, guest here said, it's the union that pays for that training, and it's the union that uh, provides for uh, skilled workers. And <clears throat> quite frankly, I think some of those people who uh, uh, defended uh, right to work, I think they lied. Well, it was certainly misinformation, and I think they're... They didn't lie. They sure beat the daylights out of the truth, and I mean that. Well, and, and it's interesting that the sometimes rather conservative Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in its fact-checking found that 95% of the dollars that went into training were union dues. They were dollars. So I, I think that even the fact-check people agree with you. I, um, I wanted to share a little bit of what I shared on the Senate floor. The, the night that this bill passed. And one of the amendments that I tried to make to the bill was to expand the investment that the state is making in poverty aid for schools. And ultimately the amendment wasn't, a, wasn't that's right, the amendment wasn't attached. But my point was, this is gonna drive down, this legislation is gonna drive down wages. It's very clear, I have a whole stack full of studies that show that not only do wages for union workers go down, but so do wages for um, non-union workers. And that the unions do a good job of providing equality and equality among races, equality among education levels. They, they do bring up, especially um, folks that haven't had a chance to go to college, especially those skilled workers that maybe don't have a college degree. I had a number of, of different stories that I, I brought from constituents, and one of them was a, a gal who was from Wisconsin, she was from Western Wisconsin, and she explained how she was a teacher, young teacher, and she had trouble making ends meet. And she and her family were on the WIC program, and they helped, were helped by a number of uh, public assistance programs because her salary was so low. And she ended up becoming an apprentice electrician and really improved the family salary. She worked very hard, she enjoyed the work, but what she found is that as soon as she got out from under what she felt were the uh, big anti-labor um, bills that passed earlier in 2011, now she's facing another anti-labor bill and she's very concerned that her wages are not gonna stay high. I brought uh, some information that I, um, a counselor, a school counselor, brought to me, 
um, the week before we heard this bill. And she brought me a little table that was poverty in Trumpelow County. And anybody that's familiar with Trumpelow County knows that there are a lot of jobs, but there are low wage jobs. And there are a couple of very large non-union factories. And in particular, those non-union factories are in Arcadia. She told me, and, and I looked up later and confirmed that from the Department of Public Instruction, that in Arcadia, those children that were in middle school and elementary school, 39% of them in 2009 were eligible for free and reduced lunch, which is the federal definition for poverty. The poverty level went from in 2009, this is middle school and grade school, 39% to in 2014, 60%. I know. From 39 to 60. And I know I sent a lot of folks this chart. I read that. You did, and were you not surprised by what I said? I, I will be using it in the Union Herald. Good. Well, that's fantastic. And then you probably remember, this didn't copy real well, but th these this dark area are all of the school districts that have between 41 and over 70% poverty. And so it shows you that this is 2013-14. We have a big problem with poverty. And I also copied a couple of charts that were from the Nonpartisan Taxpayer Alliance that showed that Wisconsin already has a wage problem. I don't know if our folks at home can see this, but our wages compared to the national wages have been going down. And this, is, this takes us to 2010, and then this is after the recession, they, were, they came up a little bit, and then they went back down again. And this takes us to 2012. And probably that very last graph must have shocked folks the most. And this graph is from the Economic Policy Institute, and I wish I had a better view of it. But this is union membership versus the middle class's share of income from 1967 to 2013. And you can see that as union membership drops, the share of middle class's share of income drops dramatically. And I don't think it's any surprise to folks at home to learn that the more we have unionized uh, workforce, the more we have a thriving middle class. And it is as we've seen, especially since the Great Recession is over, that the top 1% of the economy is doing quite well, thank you very much, but the rest of us, not so much. And it is interesting, my constituents keep reminding me that Minnesota is doing quite well, and Minnesota did something almost unheard of in my world, which was to tax that top 1%. And now they have a big budget surplus, and they're putting about $900 million into public education. And that might be a good transition to this big book here that I brought with me that's the state budget. I'm on the Labor Council and we met last night. <clears throat> and I, can't, I cannot speak for everybody there, but I can say this. A number of us, including ours truly, mm -hmm. we are frustrated about what's happening down there. And we can appreciate what folks like you and Representative Dana Locks have put up with. Now, what can the average voter do to start to turn this around, or at least draw attention to the fact that uh, uh, the average uh, worker really is uh, it's getting screwed, period. I, I know you promised not to cuss on this TV show, but I didn't, and I think the answer is they need to raise hell. <laughs> Seriously, John, they need to make their voice be known. They need to write letters. They need to write letters to the editor. I've laid out a, a, a lot of material. I've sent out almost 400 letters with this information. I want people to use it. I want people to talk to their neighbors, to talk to their friends, to make, let their voice be heard. The trouble isn't over, my friend. The trouble has just begun. We hear that the that the, some of the folks on the other side of the aisle are interested in repealing the prevailing wage laws. Yes. And if you look at this budget, there are a whole lot of things in this budget that are going to hurt folks in the Chippewa Valley. 
And thank goodness that there are not all of the Republicans are in favor of the horrible things in this budget. And I, I just want you to know my color coding. All the stuff that's red in there has to come out. And all the stuff that's green is money that I'm going to steal to fix all of the problems. There's a lot of red in this budget. A lot of and things that need to change. Day, despite the politics, you'll be able to get some money for community television, but the odds are against it, right? Well, I think that we need a, a few changes in the legislature. And I certainly am willing to draft the bill. I've drafted it in the past, introduced it in the past, but I haven't even had a hearing on it because my friends on the other side of the aisle don't want to take it up. And there are some Democrats, too. Well, uh, frankly, that's right. And the way this happened, that community television was starved for resources, goes back to my freshman year as a senator in 2007. And we had a very fine woman that was in charge of the Senate who has since retired. Her name was Judy Robson, and she was single-handedly standing in the way of a bill to deregulate the cable industry. And there was a group of folks that allied together. I called it the 800-pound gorilla, which was AT&T, and the 500-pound gorillas, which were the cable companies. And usually they don't get together. In this case, they got together to deregulate the cable company. They put together a, a fake, I called it an astroturf grassroots. It wasn't grassroots at all. It was fake grassroots. Um, organization called TV for us that was supposed to tell all the folks that had cable if we deregulate the cable business and take away the requirement that the cable companies pay a little bit to the community televisions then we'll have lower cable bills I want anybody that has a cable bill that's lower than it was in 2007 for the same services to send me a letter. And all those folks that have higher cable bills than 2007, they can send me a letter too because that was the promise of this legislation. And that, that legislation, I fought, I tried to get it to stop, to stop it, but frankly, there were Democrats and Republicans and a Democratic governor that pushed this. And I totally disagree with it and I don't think it has helped the consumers at all. It took away all the consumer protection for cable company consumers. So if you maybe don't have any cable and your, your bill doesn't get paid, uh, I mean your cable doesn't get fixed, you still have to pay the bill for having services over that time period. That's just not right. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. <clears throat> you talked about people getting involved. We have about 10 minutes left. Yours truly, and I'm sure you're aware of it, I do send emails Good. Off to our respective state legislatures. Good. And I remind them of the mistakes they're making. And this includes that idiotic budget that's coming from Governor Walker. It has a whole bunch of red in it. Yes. But they know me. And I also contact an awful lot of constituents in this area and they go on and they talk to uh, constituents and they also are emailing uh, legislators including you and Dana Walks and and some others that I, who I just don't want to mention mm -hmm. they're not worth the time oh I don't think so I think they are well, worth the time the, we need to raise our voices and say this isn't acceptable and frankly we're seeing the tide change we're seeing, I'm seeing Republicans that are my neighbors that live on the same hall, have offices on the same hall that I do, who are stopping me in the hall and saying, oh my gosh, this budget is terrible. Do you know they're taking all this money out of the UW? Do you know that the, the chancellor yesterday announced that he's got, got an early retirement program for over 300 people in, at the UW Eau Claire? The cuts are just beginning. And I just today met with a whole group of superintendents who said, we can't cut anymore. They're closing a grade school in Arkansas, in the school, Duran School District. They're cutting the middle school athletics. Mm -hmm. They have cut to the bone, those superintendents, and they're telling me there's nothing left but the soul of the school. And if you continue to cut education, we're going to lose our schools. And you know what? People don't like that. And you can tell they don't like it because dramatic increase in the number of referendums that are being passed. So much for lowering property tax when the only way these folks can find to keep their schools open is to increase their property taxes by going to a referendum. That's not what needs to happen. The state needs to put a big infusion of cash into the, into the school system and the UW. And if we do that, that will lower property taxes. 
The reason I said I would mention certain names is just because I don't want to give them um, undue publicity. Okay, but I do so. think that people should write them. Okay, please. If you really want to support community television, and I'm sure you do, you can contact State Senator Brian Hill, State Representative Walks, as well as State Representative Bernier, State Representative Petrick, State Senator Moulton, and maybe even Governor Walker. Uh, quite frankly, I did have a temper tantrum five minutes ago. I apologize for it. However, the way things are going in Madison right now, we have to make some changes. We, we, we simply do. We do. And this is a democracy. And yes, people's voices are very important. Now, I understand that there is a bill coming up that is that will uh, gut the prevailing wage. AB 33, is that correct? I, I don't know the number of the bill, but I have heard about the bill. I've been asking a lot of questions. I met with some carpenters yesterday and asked them what they knew. Right now, it's very hush-hush on if that bill is going and if they have the votes, but it would be very important for people that are concerned about this to let their legislators know, and maybe if there aren't the votes for it, the bill won't come forward. That's often how we kill a bill, is to have some quiet conversations with, with the leaders to say, no, this isn't a good idea. Now, I've also learned that in this budget, the elderly, and the disabled are going to be hurt. That's very true. Could you please expand on that? Yes. The two programs that I know of that are very going to undergo a very big change are known as Family Care and a program called IRIS. Both of these programs help the frail elderly, the developmentally disabled, and the physically disabled. And Eau Claire has a very large number of developmentally disabled because of the closing of the Northern Center several years ago, you probably remember. And these programs help people stay in their community. They give them services that would help them, for example, get up, get dressed, get transportation to a job, transportation to a medical appointment, maybe have a cook come in once a week and freeze meals for them so they have good nutrition. These are programs for people that are already med Medicaid eligible and the threshold for Medicaid is, is very low. So these are very people at the at or below the poverty. What, what has happened is that in this budget, the governor has proposed that all of these programs get taken over by what, what could possibly be a very large for-profit insurance company in a no-bid contract. For good reason, the people that are taking advantage of these programs are very worried that they're, the people that provide services to them are not going to be there. And it's very clear when I read through the budget and through the, the language, the legal language, that the program IRIS is completely gone out of the, pro, out of the statutes. That was, is what this does. And there is some sort of vague language about a self-directed program going to be underneath an HMO. But a lot of people are looking at the testimony of, of Secretary Kitty Rhodes, the person who is running the Department of Health, and they're saying, we're not sure that this is really what's happening because when she was asked direct questions like, can people keep their provider and will people get all of the same services, she would not answer yes to those questions. And that has a lot of people very, very worried, rightly so. Oh. You've made my job easy, really, yeah, because I'm supposed to sit here and ask questions. But if you provide the answers before I, before I get to ask the questions, I don't have to say that much. And I, <laughs> I appreciate that because you know what you're talking about. Nonetheless, I'm going to ask you, is there anything that you wish I should have asked or is there anything that you want to add? Well, I think people have heard about the UW cuts and they're very upset about them. I, I think people 
also need to realize that there are deep cuts to K-12 and our rural schools are already in trouble. And we need, as well as the Eau Claire School District, and we need to make sure that people, even as they're talking about these other things, they don't forget the, the K-12 school, public, public school system. There is a part of the budget that would allow students to leave the public school and take the dollars, the state dollars with them and move to a private school. And there's no limit on how many students would leave those public schools and walk out the door with their state dollars to a private school. This had us a lot of school superintendents that I spoke with this morning and this afternoon very worried that they're not gonna have enough money to keep the doors open. The point of what they're doing is that you take public dollars away from public schools and go to private schools. And this really hurts the public schools where most of the children right. are, are the vast majority of children, over 80% in this state, are, are going to public schools. And frankly, they're, the only children that are going to leave are, are maybe those parents who are a little bit more engaged. And the kids that are going to be left are the kids that have troubles, come from poorer families, are maybe special ed, have English as their second language. Uh, Arcadia is a good example. Why, why is Arcadia such a high poverty? Well, a lot of the folks are working at factories, non-unionized factory. They have English as a second language. They're kids that are, are growing up in homes that don't have enough resources to help that child. Anything else? <laughs> Because we're going to do a wrap-up right now. Okay, well, you go for the wrap-up, and then you'll have to have me back, and I'll give you an update on this budget and oh. the labor bills. Okay? Okay. All right, if I talk now? You betcha. Okay. <laughs> we get along quite well, folks. But that is our show for now. My thanks, my sincere thanks to our viewing audience. Kathleen, always good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And folks, kindly remember that Labor Talks can be seen on channel 993 and YouTube. But on channel 993, every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m., every Saturday at 12.30 p.m. And I think that's about it. Again, my thanks to Kathleen and to the viewing audience. After all, if we didn't have Kathleen, if we didn't have our audience, we wouldn't have a show. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.